Someone sent me a story about a young couple that was getting ready to be married and they were going through pastoral counseling. And uh, the pastor was trying to make sure that they were both on the same page spiritually and doctrinally. He was doing all right until he got to the subject of original sin and the young man did not believe in original sin and no matter what the pastor said he couldn't convince him. But he thought it was incidental enough that he allowed them to go ahead and get married and he didn't see him again for 20 years. 20 years later he saw them and quite surprised to see they had three teenage children and he asked the young man if they ever resolved their conflict over original sin. He said, you know what? He said, after 20 years of marriage and three teenagers, I not only believe in original sin, I believe in demon possession. <laughs> this couple was having a, a standoff fight. You know what that is? Nobody would give any ground. He was right, she was right. There was no way, that, and, and they'd been going on for a long time. And finally the young woman, she had an idea. She said, I'll tell you what, we're probably never gonna really totally honestly resolve this, but let's call a truce and we'll do it this way. I'll say I'm wrong, and then you, you just come back and say that I'm right. He said, okay. She said, I'm wrong. He said, you're right. <laughs> That's how it works. That's why it never goes anywhere, you know, it just starts all over again. And then there's a story of this man who had a heart condition. And he went to see his cardiologist and his cardiologist told him that his situation was putting him in great jeopardy, that he needed to make major lifestyle changes and that if he didn't, there wasn't anything medically he could do to help him. Being concerned for the couple, he actually, the doctor made an appointment with this man's wife, a private appointment to talk with her about her husband. She told her husband that the doctor had asked to see her and so she went for the appointment and when she got into the office, the doctor said, you know, your husband, he needs some major change in his life and you're the key part of this. You need to make sure when he comes home from work, you have a nutritional meal on the table for this man. You need to help him with the stress. He needs some shoulder rubs and some back rubs. You need to put off of your agenda all the things you want to do for these next months and concentrate solely on your husband. Do you understand me? And the appointment was over the next week. Her husband said, you see the doctor? She said, yes. And what did he tell you? She said, the doctor said you're gonna die. <laughs> I don't think the Song of Solomon teaches us that, do you? I think we should just put that away. But anyway, thank you for your love of laughter. And today we're going to talk about rekindling the fire in marriage from the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9, through the 6th chapter and verse 10. Dorothy Rosby has written an article called It's Living Together That Makes Marriage So Difficult. <laughs> And she tells a story in this article about a woman who actually shot her husband because he had eaten her chocolate. And she wrote in the article, I probably read about the incident with a Hershey bar in my hand. And at the time I may have even thought that he had it coming to him. But now that I think about it, even I, a confirmed chocoholic, think shooting was extreme. But then she adds, it's truly the little things that destroy relationships. Margarine and chocolate and nylons on the towel rack and hair in the sink. She said, I once heard about a couple who fought for more than four hours over one rubber band. He had it and she wanted it. Part of the problem is that God made opposites attract. Savers marry spenders. Neatniks pair up with slobs and early birds team up with night owls. And opposing idiosyncrasies come together in a marriage like a weather front. Solomon has returned home late, and Shulamith has punished him by refusing to let him into her room. After this incident happened, she had some second thoughts. And she changed her mind and realized that she had done the wrong thing, and so she went back to the door to let Solomon in. But alas, he had already gone. It was too late. And in a panic, she goes to the daughters of Jerusalem, who we've sort of identified as her friends, 
and she asked her girlfriends to help her find her husband. Now the extended section that follows that we're going to look at today provides some very helpful insights about keeping the fires of romance burning in a marriage. And the principles of harmony and reconciliation are everywhere in this section. We're going to divide it up into two different uh, zones, if you will. First of all, we're going to talk about what a husband needs from his wife. And then we're going to talk about what a wife needs from her husband. Let's talk for just a moment about what a husband needs from his wife. This section that we're going to begin in the ninth verse of the fifth chapter is introduced with a question from the lips of the daughters of Jerusalem or from the girlfriends of Shulamite. The question makes us realize that these two passages aren't incidentally put together, but they're connected. In the ninth verse of the fifth chapter, we read these words, the daughters of Jerusalem speaking. What is your beloved more than another beloved? O fairest among women, what is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? And you could almost hear them saying this. They're literally saying to Shulamith, why should we go to all the trouble to help you find Solomon? What makes him so special that we should go out of our way to locate him? And Shulamith responds to their question by giving them a description of Solomon as she sees him. And in her answer, she uncovers some critical needs that only a wife can fulfill. First of all, we learn that a husband needs you to be his cheerleader and champion. In verses 9 through 15, we'll see this illustrated. It is interesting, as you read the Old Testament, and if you read any literature that goes back to those times, you will find in many of the ancient Near East writings, ornate and detailed descriptions of the beauty of women at that time. We saw one recently in the fourth chapter of the Song of Solomon. But you almost never see any description of the male. But in our text today, we're going to see one. And in many ways, it is the only way that we would ever know anything at all about the way Solomon looks. See, they didn't have cameras back in the Old Testament. And even though we have today some artist renderings of the way they believe Bible personalities looked, we do not even know for sure what Jesus looked like. We do know he looks different than most of the portraits of him because when we read the Bible, we begin to learn about his outward appearance just a bit. When we're finished today, we're going to know a lot about Solomon. We'll know almost as much as if somebody handed us a picture. But it's going to be just a bit jaded because, you see, it's the picture of Solomon through the eyes of his wife. And let's hope, men, that we always look better there than we ever look anyplace else. In essence, this is the only way we would know about King Solomon. And as we learn about him, we learn some things that can help us. First of all, what does your husband need you to be? He needs you to be his cheerleader and champion. And one of the ways you do that is to affirm his identity. Shulamite begins in verse 10, answering the question of her girlfriends about why her Solomon was so special. She says, my beloved is white and ruddy and chief among 10,000. The litany of compliments on the part of Shulamith begins with a statement that seems to be self-contradictory. She says, my husband is white and he's ruddy. Now you can't be white and ruddy. Ruddy means reddish, a little darker complected. And she said he's white and he's ruddy. And you don't know how to translate that until you look up the word white and you discover that one of the meanings of the word white is the word dazzling. So she's basically saying, my husband is dazzling. And in case anyone would doubt what she means, she follows up the comment with this statement. He is chief among 10,000. He's one in a million. He's unique and distinctive. And in her eyes, there's nobody like Solomon. Now, when we're finished today, you're going to look around at your husband and you're going to compare him to the descriptions. You're going to say, what? You know, give me a husband like that, and I'll be affirming. <laughs> but you have to understand something. The husband that God gave you is the husband you're to affirm. And every husband has beauty in the eyes of his wife, and every wife surely has beauty in the eyes 
of her husband. So affirm his identity. Then notice, secondly, she affirms his intelligence in verse 11. She says, his head is like fine gold. And this is not an outward expression of his head because obviously he didn't have a gold head. But it is a statement designed to express and affirm the stateliness and the wisdom of her husband. Shulamite considered her husband to be smart. And he was. He was, we know, the wisest man in the earth. And the Bible says there was never anybody wiser than him before him and never anybody wiser after him. So she didn't have any trouble affirming his intelligence. But ladies, however hard you have to work to do this, you have to find some way to affirm your husband's intelligence. Because there's not anything that I know of that will discourage a man than for his wife to make comments that demean his intellectual ability. And you can help him so much. You don't have to say things that are untrue, but you can do some research and find a few things that are true and affirm them. Affirm his identity, his intelligence, and now she's going to affirm his individuality, his uniqueness, his specialness. She enters into a full-length description of Solomon from head to toe. She actually makes specific comments about nine different parts of his body. And she obviously considers him to be the most handsome man on this earth. First of all, she talks about his hair. Verse 11, his locks are wavy and black as a raven. His hair is black and wavy. And apparently Solomon's hair was curly, wavy, curly. And it was very long and it hung in wavelets, as you will, over his shoulders. Worn long and black as a raven. Interestingly enough, we already learned that Shulamite's hair was black as well. And that is not uncommon in Israel. You often find the people of Israel with black hair. And this helps explain his hair being full of the dew of the night when he comes home to Shulamite late. We remember that one of the things that indicated what time he got back home was that the Bible says his hair was full of the dew of the night, which falls in Palestine later on beyond the evening time. And so here's Solomon with his long curly hair and he comes home late and his hair is all wet. It's full of the dew of the night. Shulamite goes on now to talk about his eyes. His eyes are brilliant and winsome. Verse 12. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of the waters washed with milk and fitly set. And the best I can explain this is Shulamite pictures the dark irises of Solomon's eyes surrounded by the white of his eyes and she looks at that and she says it's like a dove bathing in milk <laughs> and she sees his eyes as so perfect and she says they're fitly set in his head like diamonds are you getting the picture then she talks about his cheeks and she says his cheeks are bearded and fragrant Verse 13, his cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. And the words banks of scented herbs and words translated to grow hair. Solomon had a beard and the cologne or perfume was in his beard making it sweet smelling. And then she talks about his lips and she said, his lips are bright and red. His lips are lilies dripping liquid myrrh. His lips are red, not white. They're sweet, not bitter. And as in the earlier references to the lips of Shulamite, this is probably not only a reference to his lips and their formation, but also to the words that may have come from his lips. And then she says, his arms are bronzed and strong. Notice verse 14, his hands are rods of gold set with burl. And the word translated hands here could be used to describe any part of the arm. And it is most likely a description of the strong and well-proportioned arms of Solomon. He had guns. <laughs> he, uh, he had some strength. 
And the color of gold describes his skin tone or perhaps his tan. Now, just review for a moment what this woman sees in her man. And you're beginning to see she considers him to be the most unusual specimen of humanity her eyes have ever fallen upon. Next, she says his torso is built and chiseled. Verse 14 says his body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. Solomon not only had guns, he had a six-pack. <laughs> Men, how would you like to have a body that is described as carved ivory? I must confess to you, no one has ever said that to me. <laughs> and that is exactly how Shulamite thought of Solomon. In our day, he would have been a regular at some local fitness center. <laughs> And Dalich, the Old Testament commentator who writes about these Old Testament books, has an interesting thought here. He says, inlaid with sapphires means nothing else than the blanching blue veins under his white skin. Have you ever seen a guy who's really buffed up and he's got real strong muscles and you can literally see the veins in his muscle and in his, in, under his skin? That's what she's saying. And she's not through. She said his legs are big and powerful. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. This description of Solomon's legs was intended to reflect strength and muscular and athletic contouring of the thighs and of the calves. And the bases of fine gold refers to his feet. His, the pillars of his legs are down on bases of gold. So she's saying Solomon has strong legs and good feet. And then she speaks of his face in verse 15. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. One author says that it is impossible to describe a mere man in terms of the majesty of Lebanon. But we cannot forget that in Shulamite's eyes, her lover is beyond comparison. She's reaching for anything she can find to describe the way she feels about him. And finally, his mouth is beautiful and sweet. And this is more of a description, again, of Solomon's words than of his actual mouth. We might better say, his words are sweet. Eugene Peterson, who's given to us the message, which is the paraphrase of all of the Bible, he paraphrases that verse this way. He says, his words are kisses and his kisses are words. And then as if she might have forgotten something that she should have said, Shulamite sums it all up in verse 16 when she says, yes, he is altogether lovely. And remember, she's just answering a question her girlfriend's asked her. And she goes off into this soliloquy. They ask her the wrong question. Why is Solomon so different than anyone else? Why is your beloved beyond any other beloved? In other words, why should we take our time and go find Solomon? You want to know? Here it comes. In this long speech from Shulamith about Solomon. She knew she needed to be his cheerleader and his champion. And even though she's not saying these words to Solomon, Solomon will hear them. And she's describing in glowing terms the one she loves. Positive affirmation of human characteristics are very important to the continuation of a strong and solid marriage. We've learned through this whole series that our words are so critical. And we need to go out of our way, women, to affirm our husbands. Nothing is more important to your husband than to know that you respect him and that you hold him in honor. Your husband also needs you to be his companion and complement, your champion and cheerleader, your companion and complement. And we learn next in this text that Solomon and Shulamith are not just Two people who have mutual admiration for one another. They're not just people who have a great relationship physically, but they are friends and they are lovers. And how majestically this is brought out in our text. I'm sure it's no secret to you that I love the Bible and I love the study of the Bible. And one of the reasons I love it is because the Bible is so full of surprises. <laughs> And here in the book of the Song of Solomon, there are two expressions that are meant for us to notice if we will do our homework. And the first one is found in the 16th verse of the 5th chapter, where Shulamith is saying, This is my beloved. Now what's the next phrase? This is my 
friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. She is saying to her girlfriends, Solomon is more than just my husband. Solomon's my friend. And later on in verse 3 of chapter 6, once again she is speaking, but she reverses this around so that it affirms the other side of the equation. She says, I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. First of all, she says to Solomon of him, this is my beloved. And then she says of herself, I am his beloved. We are each other's beloveds. <laughs> and we are friends. What a great statement. Are you friends? You say, good night, pastor, we're married. I'm going to ask you the question again. Are you friends? <laughs> I've known couples that were married and they weren't friends. Oh, they had no intention of getting divorced. They did all of the important things of a marriage, but given the opportunity to spend time with somebody else as, as opposed to their own wife or husband, she wasn't in the top five. <laughs> he wasn't in the top five. Let me ask you this question. If you could spend time with anybody that you know in the whole world, who would you like to spend time with? I'll be honest. I'd rather spend time with Donna than anybody. And I don't want you to feel upset about that. It's just true. If I had my choice, I'd rather be with her than anybody else. What a great thing to be friends with your partner. This has nothing to do with sex. It has nothing to do with any of the other things. It's just what a privilege to be able to walk through life together as intimate friends with one another. And to share things that you never share. To understand things that nobody else understands. And when you have a relationship like that in your marriage, it is beyond just the outwardness of the marriage. It is all the unspoken things, all of the intuitions that you have. It's being able to answer questions before they're asked, to anticipate things that have never been expressed. And that is such a beautiful part of being married. And one of the things that is joyous for us is that our marriage has endured now these years and all of the history that we have known together. And I've known Donna for the vast majority of my life now. We've been married over 40 years and we got married in our late teens, early 20s. So I've been with her twice as long as I have been by myself. <laughs> and we have all this history together. And when we travel and when we serve, we remember people and people come up to see us that call out a memory from some memory in our life 20 years ago. And I tell you, the treasured memories of a married couple who stays focused on the Lord and on each other is one of the greatest gifts you will ever have. It's worth fighting for. You may be in a position right now where you think, man, I don't know if, it, oh, it's worth fighting for. You may not think so now, but down the road you will look back and say, oh, I'm so glad we persevered and we got over that tough place and our marriage is still together. Here's a great summary statement I read this week of this particular section. Because Solomon was the king, Shulamite had to share him in some ways with the daughters of Jerusalem. But as a lover, he was hers alone. Shulamite meant that all the other things that she had enumerated about him, though they were important, were of less significance to her than that he was her lover. And this suggests that in any successful marriage there is genuine friendship as well as romance. For Shulamith and Solomon, in addition to their intimate expressions of affection, there was also the desire simply to be together. Each of them had their own friends. Yet their most important friendship was the friendship they had with each other. I covet that for all of us here. What a wonderful joy to have a friendship that lasts throughout your whole life with the one you love. Now, this section started with a question. Remember what the question was? Why should we care about Solomon? And why is he different than any other beloved? I think that through her long speech, Shulamith has convinced her girlfriends that Solomon was worth hunting for. And so now that they're convinced, they come up with another question, which introduces the sixth chapter. Notice, where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? And where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? It appears that Shulamith has convinced her, her girlfriends that Solomon's worth hunting for, and now they want to know where to look. 
And her answer reveals a great deal about her understanding of her husband. She was pretty sure where he was. He's gone to one of his favorite places where he feels a sense of great peace. He's confused perhaps about what happened, maybe disappointed in himself, maybe still a little bit upset with her. But he finds solace in this place. And interestingly enough, he knew where it was and so did she. He has gone to his garden, she says. And according to Ecclesiastes, Solomon was a great naturalist. When I studied the book of Ecclesiastes, I uncovered this truth in the fifth verse of the second chapter. Here we read Solomon saying, I have made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. There's more about this in the Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes, but Solomon was a naturalist. He loved being in the gardens that he had planted. Shulamith, where shall we find your husband? Well, I'm not sure where he is, but I would guess he's probably in his garden. If that happened to you ladies, do you know where your husband would be? Working on his car, fishing, hunting, playing golf? Do you know the passion of his life? Do you know where he goes to gather his thoughts? Shulamith did. She was not only his wife, and his lover she was his friend and she knew him and the Bible tells us men that we are to take that seriously we're to live with our wives what does the scripture say according to what knowledge we're to know our wives this turns it around on the other side but we're to know our wives somebody said get a notebook and take notes on her <laughs> get to know her you will refer to it often I don't know that you need to do that physically but you need a notebook up here you know some things that you will never do again. Do you not, men? Amen. Amen. Can I tell you one of the things I did that I wish I'd never done? Several years ago, when I was still running before my knees started to give me grief, I was trying to get Donna involved in, in running with me. And we were doing a little bit of it, mostly fast walking, but running. So it was her birthday. And I bought her a really expensive pair of running shoes. And it was not appreciated, I will tell you. <laughs> I regretted that for many, many weeks. It became a joke between us. It wasn't a very romantic gift. We learn by the things we do that we wish we hadn't done, but we learn because we have a desire to know this one that we've committed our life to. Isn't that, if you really love somebody, you want to know everything about them. You want, intimacy is the total revelation of oneself to another, and only in a marriage is that possible. Well, that's what a husband needs from his wife. And I don't have very much time to talk about what a wife needs from her husband, only because we've talked a lot about that, and there's a great deal of repetition here, but let's go through the rest of this. There's some important points that we need to make. Much of what Solomon says to Shulamith in the next few verses sounds familiar to us. He has made a speech to her recorded in chapter 4 that is almost exactly word for word for what we're going to read now. And I thought about that this week and I came up with this thought, gals. You should not expect a man to actually come up with something original every time. If you get one good speech out of him, you should be thankful and you should give him permission to repeat it often making a little addition and correction here and there but we're not given to long uh, original speeches most of us however there are some phrases that Solomon uses that we haven't seen before and they illustrate the priority of time and talk in verses 4 through 7 we're reading now Solomon's words oh my love he says you are beautiful as Tirzah lovely as Jerusalem awesome as an army with banners let me just help you understand that a little bit before we move forward Solomon describes his wife as Tirzah and lovely as Jerusalem Tirzah was a very simple kind of an agricultural city that ultimately became one of the capitals of the divided kingdom Jerusalem was where the palace was where the king resided and what Solomon is saying is so rich in imagery and he's saying even though no cities could be more different than each other what Solomon is saying is that his wife's beauty as is simple and innocent and fresh 
as the little agricultural city of Tirzah, and it is so majestic and elegant that it's like the city of Jerusalem. She has a unique and unspoiled beauty, and yet her beauty is also very majestic. All I can say is good speech, Solomon. In the last part of verse 4, King Solomon says that his wife is awesome as an army of banners. And it's such an important thing to him that he repeats it again in verse 10. Now only someone like Solomon could fully understand the intent of these words. You see, Solomon was a military man, not just a naturalist. He was a man for all seasons. He was a great military leader. And on many occasions he had witnessed the army marching forward behind the banners of the nation. And the intent here is that such a sight to Solomon was overwhelming. It was intoxicating. It was intimidating. And he is saying that Shulamite's beauty exercised the same kind of influence over him that he felt when he stood in that royal regal procession behind the banners of the nation. And as a side note, it was the power of women to so influence the king that caused his ultimate failure. He was mesmerized by the women of foreign nations. He married them. He ultimately began to worship their pagan gods and God said that's enough. You get to the end of Solomon's life, he was in his 50s. And for all intents and purposes, he had sinned away his opportunity to lead. Solomon had a weakness for women. We can say that if a man has 700 wives, 300 concubines, you'd say he has got a weakness for women. But at this particular stage in his life, his weakness is only for one woman. It's for the woman Shulamith. He illustrates the importance of a wife needing our time and our talk, and he expresses his love for Shulamith. And then your wife needs tenderness and touch. In the 8th through the 10th verse of the 6th chapter, we read some interesting words. In fact, these words are arresting if you study this book. Listen to these words. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her, the daughter saw her and called her blessed, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Now, first of all, what is Solomon saying? Solomon's tenderness toward his wife is borne out now in the comparison that he makes to all of the other women who resided in or near the palace. He says that Shulamith is the favorite of her mother. She is loved by all the daughters of Jerusalem, and her beauty is so awesome that even the other women in the palace call her blessed and praise her. When we first read the statement about the 60 queens and the 80 concubines, we're caught off guard. Didn't we understand that Solomon's relationship with Shulamith was at the very early part of his reign before he had sought after many wives and disobeyed the Lord? How can we understand this comment? First of all, we must realize that this is very different from the description of Solomon in his later life. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 3 says that Solomon had 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines at the end of his life. Surely what is said here isn't even close. But there must be some explanation because we do believe that Solomon is in love with Shulamith and at this point in time he has not become what we would today call a polygamist. He is a one woman man yet we have this description. And finally if you dig deeper you'll discover what was going on. What happened was that when Solomon came to the throne, there were women who were attached to the palace. When Solomon's father David died, many members of his harem survived him. And one example is the woman in the Bible we know as Abishag, about whom you can read in the book of 1 Kings. We actually have the record of one of these women. So I believe the women of the court who are mentioned by Solomon are the acknowledged beauties of the palace. The mention of the word virgins is another indication that the verse should not be understood as Solomon's personal harem. He's talking here about the fact that he walks out into his kingdom. There are a lot of women. You could just imagine that in the palace of Israel, there'd be a lot of beautiful women hanging around. I'd hesitate to call them groupies, but they were just hanging around the palace. Part of the aristocratic, majestic system of the day. All that Solomon is saying is when I look out at all these women and I look into the eyes of my Shulamith, she's more beautiful to me than all of them. 
His final words concerning his wife are found in verse 10. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? Once again, if I could appeal to Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this particular passage, he says it this way. Listen to this. Has anyone ever seen anything like this? Dawn fresh, moon lovely, sun radiant, ravishing as the night sky with its galaxies of stars. Now that one's worth trying. Honey, you are dawn fresh, moon lovely, sun radiant, and you are so ravishing, you're ravishing as the night sky with its galaxies of stars. Title of today's message is Rekindling the Fires of Marriage. Solomon and Shulamith have been our teachers, and we are indebted to them once again for what they have shared. And each of us must do what we can in our marriages to keep the fires of romance burning. And if they have started to die out, to rekindle them. How do you rekindle a marriage that has lost its zip and its fire? How do you fix a marriage that seems to have grown cold? What do you do? You do what the Word of God tells you to do. First of all, the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. Well, I don't feel like it. It doesn't say anything about that. It just says, husbands, love your wives. You say, how can you love somebody if you don't feel like loving them? Husbands, love your wives. That's not an option. That is a matter of obedience. And here's what I discovered. If you love your wife as you should love your wife, ultimately the feelings will return. Psychologists tell us that we cannot command our feelings, and I believe that's true. But we can command our will. And we can love our wives. You say, well, how do you love someone if you don't feel like loving them? All right, let me appeal again to the book of Revelation. Go back and do the first work. Say that with me. Go back and do the first works. What's, what is that? Go back and do what you were doing before you let this thing grow cold. Go back and treat her as the princess that she is. And go back and, and do the things that you once did to express to her the love that you had in your heart. And at the first, you may not feel like it, but if you do it in obedience, God will give you the grace to do it. And in the process of doing it, you will discover again that lost sense that you long to have back. If you wait till your feelings are right, the gap will grow until it will be unrecoverable. But take the admonition. And isn't that not what Shulamith and Solomon did? They had a bad night. It turned out not to be a good thing at all. He's gone away. Shulamith could have sat in her own little room there and saying, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not the one that came home late. He came home late, not me. It's not my fault. And he's going to make it right. But that one she did. When she realized that she had done something she shouldn't have done, she took the initiative to go find Solomon. Isn't it interesting that when she found him, he was willing to be found and his expression to her is like hers to him marriage is not something that just automatically happens because we say some words in front of a preacher at an altar marriage is just not living happily ever after that's from a fantasy world marriage is hard work can I get a witness marriage is hard work but it is work that is worth doing with huge rewards, not only for now, but for the future and for the generations to come. I am so glad that I have lived long enough for my grown children to see that their mom and dad are still great friends and love each other deeply. That is a lesson you teach your kids that you can't communicate in words. It's a lifestyle lesson. And I covet that for all of us. No matter where we are, you say, well, Pastor, this is the problem with a series like this. I'm already past messing up, and, 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 and I lost it, and, and I, here's the beauty of God. God says to you, wherever you are, I'll take you from where you are to where you need to go. Don't, the, the, Satan will try to get you to live in all the past mistakes and failures. Don't go there. That's not God's business. That's the devil's business. I was telling my wife on the way home, we're a bit tired. I said, you know what? I've made a discovery. As we get older... We have to teach our mind to tell our body what to do more than we used to. 
You can't let your body be in control. You have to, you know, how many of you know that as you get a little bit older, the thought of getting up to go exercise is very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> Not very fun at all. But you have to win that war. The reason why a lot of people let themselves fall apart is they, don't, they lose that war. Your mind has to be in control of your body. You know what? I think that's scriptural. I really do. I think Paul says something about that in the New Testament. And when it comes to our marriages, we have to use the same strategy. We know what we should do. Why don't we do it? Because we let our feelings and our emotions and our body take control. And God wants to be on the throne in our heart and in our mind so that he can lead us to victory. And if we will yield to him, that's exactly what he will do. But this is no place for wimps. This is not a walk in the park. This is discipline and determination and desire filled with the Holy Spirit to have a relationship with your spouse that not only brings joy to your heart, but honors the God you serve. And if you will make that your goal, I will stand. Apostasy doesn't reflect the rise of atheism in and of itself, nor does it apply to everyone who chooses religious systems other than Christianity. Instead, the concept of falling away has a narrower focus. It applies specifically to apparent Christians, to those who claim to follow Jesus, but then turn their backs on him. Every apostate is an unbeliever, but not every unbeliever is an apostate. Here's what I mean. There are many people who have never heard the gospel. They wouldn't know the gospel for many things. So they can't be apostate. They can't walk away from something they never heard of before. They are unbelievers because they have not heard. But an apostate is well acquainted with the gospel. He knows more than enough to be saved, but he walks away from it anyway. In the sun also rises, Ernest Hemingway said, there are two ways to go bankrupt, gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> and it's the same with spiritual bankruptcy. We drift away gradually, and then suddenly we're out in the cold. Are we living in the end times? There may have never been another time in history when end times prophecy has been more aligned with the culture and circumstances of the world than it is today. I believe there are 10 phenomena we are witnessing today that were recorded centuries ago in Bible prophecy. Seeing our circumstances in light of these prophecies should give us resolve, purpose, and hope. And help us answer the questions. What are we to do with the world around us? What hope do we have in times like these? And ultimately, where do we go? from here. The Bible predicts the falling away of the church. Is that what we are seeing today, including believers who are deconstructing their faith? There seems to be a growing number of people rejecting God altogether and choosing no faith at all. Is apostasy a sign of the end times? Join Dr. David Jeremiah for this special prophecy edition of Turning Point as he presents a sign of the end times, the falling away, a theological prophecy. Imagine writing your first book at the age of 22 and watching it land on a bestsellers list everywhere. A few years ago that happened to an American pastor his book conveyed biblical advice about love and relationship, and it encouraged thousands of young people to make better choices. This pastor became known for his speaking and writing and counseling, as well as for nearly two decades of pastoral ministry in a local church. Yet somehow and somewhere during those years, his own relationship with God evaporated. In 2019, he announced his marriage had come to an end. Then, in a follow-up post on Instagram, he disclosed an even deeper divorce. He wrote, quote, I have undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. The popular phrase for this is deconstruction. The biblical phrase is falling away. 
By all the measurements that I have for defining a Christian, he wrote, I am not a Christian. Many people tell me that there's a different way to practice faith, and I want to remain open to this, but I am not there now. Now, that probably touches you in some way, but it cuts me to the heart because I am a pastor, and this is happening to more pastors than I've ever seen before. Many others seem to be falling away from Christ and his gospel. I saw a recent op-ed with this title, Everyone is Leaving Christianity and Nobody Knows Where They're Going. This departure from biblical faith is happening so often that there's a new word that's been coined. These defectors are no longer evangelicals, they're ex-evangelicals. Why is that? And what is that all about? Well, the falling away is not a new phenomenon. Throughout history, there have been many who have taken up the banner of Christ only to lay it down again. Even the first generation of Christians faced challenges like this. Have you ever heard about a guy named Demas? <laughs> yeah, when Paul wrote to the Colossians and to Philemon, he sent them greetings from his co-worker Demas, who was at his side. In 2 Timothy 4.10, he described him like this, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I'm almost hesitant to read Christian news sites these days because it seems like every time I do, I read or hear of somebody else who's walked away from their faith. Recent headlines are not encouraging, and neither are the statistics. There are more than 72 million millennials in America, almost one quarter of our population. An increasingly large percentage of that generation has walked away from faith of any kind, choosing to identify themselves as religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S. When you check on the questionnaire, are you a Baptist, are you a Presbyterian, are you a Charismatic, are you a Catholic, and the bottom part says none of the above, that's where they all check, none of the above. In 2008, researchers noted that close to a third of all millennials described themselves as religiously unaffiliated. And just 10 years later, that number had grown to 42%. And there are more troubling numbers. Church membership in America has suffered a decades-long decline. No matter what you hear from church growth experts about the explosion of the church, let me give you the truth. When Gallup first measured U.S. church membership in 1937, the number came in at 73%. In early 1980s, more than 70% of American adults were church members. In the year 2000, it was 65%. By 2010, it was 59%. And now less than half of Americans, 47%, belong to the local church. And there are corresponding declines in regular church attendance. That's not a good sign. That's not a good study. That's not a good trend. But the core issue here isn't even people falling away from the church or falling away from faith. We're talking in this lesson about falling away from Jesus himself. These are people who have, and these words are stark, trampled the Son of God underfoot treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and insulted the spirit of grace. What does this mean? What does this mean to us? Apostasy doesn't reflect the rise of atheism in and of itself, nor does it apply to everyone who chooses religious systems other than Christianity. Instead, the concept of falling away has a narrower focus. It applies specifically to apparent Christians, to those who claim to follow Jesus, but then turn their backs on him. Every apostate is an unbeliever, but not every unbeliever is an apostate. Here's what I mean. There are many people who have never heard the gospel. They wouldn't know the gospel from anything. So they can't be apostate. They can't walk away from something they never heard of before. They are unbelievers because they have not heard. But an apostate is well acquainted with the gospel. He knows more than enough to be saved, but he walks away from it anyway. In the sun also rises, Ernest Hemingway said, there are two ways to go bankrupt. 
gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> and it's the same with spiritual bankruptcy. We drift away gradually and then suddenly we're out in the cold. Why am I talking about this theme of falling away? Why should I even bring it up? It seems sort of extraneous to some of you wondering, where is he going with this? Because the proliferation of apostasy is an important but overlooked often piece to the end times puzzle. As we know from scripture, one of the signs of the end times is a rising number of self-proclaimed Christians who ultimately reject Christ. Let me show you where that is in the Bible. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Here's what the Word of God says. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now listen carefully. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This is indeed a prophecy about tomorrow that has implications for us today. This falling away that Paul is writing about is not just some gradual defection from the church. Paul calls this the falling away, like it's a specific thing at a specific time, at a specific moment. Paul calls this departure from the faith, and it will happen according to the scripture during what we call the tribulation period. Now most of you know enough about prophecy to know there's some general things you should be aware of. First of all, the next thing that's going to happen in the future is the rapture of the church. The Bible says that the Lord is going to descend and take to heaven those who have put their trust in Him. And that can happen at any time. There's no signs for that. It could happen before we say amen at the end of this service. We could go to heaven before we go home, and that would be all right because we'd really be home then. Amen? So you don't have to worry about that. You know, you say, well, what has got to happen before Jesus comes to get us? Not one thing. He can come any time. After the rapture, when the saints are all gone, on this earth... The Bible teaches there's going to be a period of seven years of tribulation. This will be literally hell on earth. And it's divided into two sections. Three and a half years, the first part of the tribulation. And the last part, the last three and a half years, is called the Great Tribulation. Now, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, In the tribulation period, there's going to be a great falling away. A great defection from the faith. Now, let's just suppose that this is not something that happens until the middle of the tribulation. I don't believe that's true, but let's just give ourselves a little wiggle room here. Let's say that this falling away doesn't happen until halfway through the tribulation period. That would be three and a half years. And let's remember that the tribulation commences immediately after the rapture of the church. Watch this. And let's not forget that the rapture could happen at any moment and that the tribulation is a period of seven years so that the middle of the tribulation is just three and a half years. If all those things are true, and they are, the falling away could happen within our lifetime. If Jesus came back today, it would happen within three and a half years. So this isn't just something way out in the future that we don't have to be concerned about. It could happen, and it could start happening before we go to heaven. It won't fully completely happen until we're in heaven, but it could start happening before then. The Christians in Thessalonica were facing this kind of persecution, so they believed the last days were upon them, and they were troubled, and we should be troubled when we go through trouble, right? That's part of it. But Paul wrote this letter to them to say, look, don't be soon troubled, because the falling away hasn't happened yet, so you're not in the tribulation. If you're in the tribulation, the falling away would have happened, but it hasn't happened. That hasn't happened for us yet either. You know, I sometimes hear people talk about how before Jesus comes back, we're going to have this great worldwide revival. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Well, I hope we do, but there's not anything in the Bible about that. Somebody got their wires mixed when they started teaching that because that's not true. You know what is in the Bible? In the Bible it says there's going to be a great defection from the faith before Jesus comes back. 
And there is going to be a revival in the tribulation period. You know why? 144,000 Jewish witnesses are going to be let loose on the earth. If you can't get a revival with that, there's no hope. And two witnesses, two special witnesses are going to do miraculous things. And the Bible says that thousands will come to Christ during the tribulation period, but not before we go to heaven. Could there be a great awakening? I believe there could be, and I pray that there would be every day because that will just give us a few more years to preach the gospel. Sometimes I think we might be on the edge of it, and then sometimes I think it's so far away you'll never see it. But what I want you to know is this. While the scripture does not prophesy a great revival, that doesn't mean there couldn't be one. But what you need to know what the scripture does prophesy is there will be a defection at the end of the age. So here is this prophecy in Thessalonians. And John put it this way. This is really a very specific verse. 1 John 2, 18 and 19. He said, It is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us. They were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. John said there are many people who, who are in the church and they went out and they became part of the false gospel. He said they went out because they were never a part of us. They went out from us, but they were never of us. How can this happen? How could anyone who has tasted the goodness of Christ in the church and the love of God, how could they ever fall away? Well, I'm going to give you three things that could happen. And I think they all are in play. Why do some people get discouraged and walk away from their faith? First of all, some people fall away because they're deceived. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says it this way. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. According to this passage of Scripture, there are unseen demonic forces that are operating in our world, enticing and deceiving people into abandoning the faith in Christ. Their influence, even in the church, will only increase as we draw near to the end of history. It's overwhelming to see the deception that's going on within the church. You can watch it. You can see it. Maybe it's touched you or your family. You've been victimized by it. The passage in 1 Timothy warns of false teachers who traffic in lies and hypocrisy. These men and women attempt to cause spiritual damage and to manipulate God's people for their own purposes. They're cold, they're callous, and they're calculating. And Paul says they don't even have a conscience anymore. It's been seared. They have lost moral sensitivity and their spiritual compasses are broken. That's the reason why some people fall away. They get caught up in a spiritual scam. Can I get a witness? Amen. Some people fall away because they're disillusioned. In Luke 8, Jesus told a parable illustrating the reasons why people fall away from the gospel. You know the parable. He said there was this farmer who went out to sow seed and he broadcast it over a wide area. And some of the seed fell on pathway or on road where it was trampled down. Other seed fell on a rocky soil, and as soon as the plants sprang up, they withered away, having no root. And some seed fell in a thorny patch and were choked by briars. And some of the seed fell on prepared soil, yielding a great harvest. When the Lord's disciple asked him to explain the parable, he revealed that the seed represented the gospel message. Here is Jesus' explanation of what that story means. He said, those by the wayside are the ones who hear... And the devil comes and takes away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy and have no root, who believe for a while in time of temptation, fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Here's what Jesus was saying. The first reason people walk away from the gospel is that the devil comes and takes the word out of their hearts. Did you know that? I sometimes have prayed, Lord, don't let the devil steal the word of God from the people of God before they get to the parking lot. 
because I think that he's really active at the end of a service. Whatever you heard that maybe touched your heart or caused you to think something that you should think, if you're not careful, before you get out of this place, the devil will come and steal right out of your heart. The second reason is more complicated. Jesus describes those who hear the gospel and they receive the word with joy. Listen to that. That means they're emotional. And these people are genuinely excited about Christianity. They've seen the brokenness of the world and they felt the brokenness in their own spirit and they know there must be something better. And these people encounter the truth and they receive the message with joy and they're all excited and they see a pathway to peace and purpose and meaning. It's what they've always been looking for. But stony ground believers have no root. So when times of testing come, the Bible says they fall away. Many of these people are not looking for a savior, they're looking for a solution. <laughs> they want their problems to go away and they don't want to surrender anything to get that. They want the blessings of belief without the burden of swimming against the cultural stream. And they like the idea of the gospel, but they lack a personal commitment to Christ. Sooner or later, when they begin to be disillusioned, disenchanted, and disappointed, they just fall away. I know people like that. Sometimes the people that are most emotional about being saved are the same people who are the most emotional about what happens to them when anything comes into their life they're not expecting. And how many of you know God gets blamed for everything? <laughs> Some people fall away because they're deceived, others because they're disillusioned. And the last one is probably where a lot of us would fit if we're in any of these categories. Some fall away because they're distracted. Verse 14 of Luke 8 says, Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with cares and the pleasures of life and they bring no fruit to maturity. Jesus said many fall away simply because they get distracted. When forced to choose between spiritual things following Christ and physical cares and riches and pleasures of life, they can't see past their own noses. They allow the pull of desire to lead them. They let go of their faith in order to grab all that the world has and they grab with both hands and there's nothing left to hold on to Jesus with. I know that's not a pretty picture, but what God has chosen us to be here for as his witnesses, this is the critical thing. So as Francis Schaeffer once said, how should we then live with all this going on? What should we do? How can we make sure that we are never among those who fall away? I know this, there's not a person in this room who if you sat down and talked to them and said, would you like to be among those who fall away? Nobody would say yes. Nobody wants to do that. It's nobody's purpose to do that. You have children who've done that. You have friends who've done that. You know the pain of that. You don't want anything to do with that. So how do we protect ourselves from that happening to us and to the people we love? First of all, examine yourselves. That's what the scripture says. 2 Corinthians 13:5 examine yourselves as to whether or not you're in the faith test yourselves do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you the most important thing you can do in response to this message is to make sure that you are truly a Christian and you are not a Christian just because you grew up in the church you are not a Christian just because your parents are Christians you're not a Christian because you've lived a good life you are not a Christian because you have served in the church and done great things for God. One of the most sobering passages in the Bible is found in Matthew chapter 7. Here's what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many said Jesus will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Is there a more stark, frightening verse than that? Jesus is not saying that good works do not matter. What he is saying is that good works... If you want to read more about this, I suggest you read the book of James when you get home today. Go back to the second Corinthian passage. It says, do you not know that Christ is in you? Let me ask you that question. Do you know that Christ is in you? Have you put your trust in him? Are you certain that he's living in your heart? This is not some cultural Christianity. Sometimes people grow up in Christian families and they think, well, my parents were Christians. My brothers and sisters are Christians. I must be a Christian too. Not. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He just has children. So that's the most important thing. 
Has there ever been a time in your life when you have personally invited Christ to forgive you of your sin and become your Savior? That is what matters. That is what determines whether you are a true Christian or a Christian in name only. That's the one thing. If you get that straight, you will never fall away. Number two, encourage yourselves. I love this. In 1 Samuel 36, we read this about David. David was in one big mess. He was in a fight for his life. His troops were all fighting with him. They left camp one day. When they came back, all their families had been taken, including their wives and their children. And David's their leader. And you can imagine how that went through the camp. And they hated David. They turned on him. They were going to kill him. He had nobody. He was totally all by himself. And this is what it says. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You must not wait for someone else to do this for you. This is your responsibility, yourself. There's some things we need to do. First of all, we need to examine ourselves and make sure we're in the faith. You, you can all do that. In fact, you don't probably have to do much of an examination. You already know. Secondly, encourage yourself. You say, well, I'm kind of down now about my faith. Well, I'm sorry about that, but, you know, there's not anybody going to rush to your help. So learn how to do it yourself. <laughs> learn how to take care of yourself in the Word of God. Learn how to take care of yourself in building up your most holy faith. It's good to have people help you. It's wonderful to be in a small group where somebody encourages you. But that's not always going to happen. So you better learn how to take care of yourself. Number three, this one you'll love. Exercise yourself. I love this verse. Exercise yourself toward godliness, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. If you want to stay confident and strong in your faith, it is important that you keep growing in your faith. Stagnant faith is the devil's playground, and he will fill your heart and mind with doubts, just when you really need God, it will occur to you that He has not been very important to you late in life. Some of you walked with the Lord really closely, but you've gotten so busy with everything, and maybe your business is in trouble, and you've got family problems and all that, and you said, well, I'm just going to put God on hold until I get through this. The worst thing you could ever do. And the best thing you can do to assure yourself of your walk with the Lord is just keep walking with Him. Set new goals for the things you're going to do with Christ. Ask Him every day, Lord, what can I do for you? How can I be a part of what you're doing? Show me the way to be involved in the kingdom. If you just want to be a bystander and sit on the sideline, you are a target. If you're going to be a target, at least be a moving one, right? <laughs> moving forward. Moving forward to do something for God. You know, it's possible to start out well, to love Jesus with all of your heart, and then all of a sudden one day you realize things aren't the way they used to be. That's what happened to the people in Ephesus. And God had warned them, and John wrote this in Revelation 2. He said, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember from where you have fallen, repent, and do the first works. John said to the people in Ephesus, At one time you were really red hot for God. You were on fire church was open for something that needed to be done and you were the first one to volunteer anything that could help move the ball forward for christ you were on the team but then suddenly a lot of other things came along like we read about in the parable you were choked out by everything that's going on in the world and if you're not careful your faith can be marginalized until it really has no impact on your life at all that's what john told these people in ephesus that, that was so cold their faith had grown cold Maybe it's time for you to do a little self-examination and ask yourself, am I walking like I once did or have I allowed all these things to push me away? Remember, this is your choice. Jesus is with you. He will keep you from falling and he will empower you. He has every intention of presenting you faultless before the Father once your race comes to an end. So until that moment, just keep going, keep running. Don't look back. Don't give up. Commit to building up your faith and the faith of those around you. And let me give you a little benediction to end this message and to bless your life, the blessing of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forevermore. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Praise God. We have a...